It controls our thinking, feelings, and movements. At this exhibition in southern France, children learn about some of our brain secrets. A guided tour by its curator will also lead us to discover how European researchers are trying to unlock the brain's deepest mysteries and its amazing capacities. Evolution led to the creation of many different brains in animals, each of them with very different capabilities. And even in human beings, we have brains that differ a lot from one individual to another, depending on how we're going to use our brain, on our life experiences, on our accumulated knowledge, we will develop more or less cognitive functions. This plasticity is what transforms our brain into a unique organ, perfectly adapted to each individual. In the past, brains could only be studied in corpses, during or after autopsies. Nowadays, we're able to watch, in real time, a live brain working, thanks to medical imaging. These innovations are helping us to understand much better how our brains work. For sure, everyone is afraid of touching this fragile human organ. Neurosurgery is not an anodyne appendicitis operation. Dealing with the brain still creates quite a lot of apprehension. At this hospital in Lithuania, an unusual test is underway. Patients with head trauma are provided with strange plastic glasses to measure the pressure on their brain tissues. Until now, these measurements, key to determine if patients are at risk of further brain damage, involved literally drilling the skull, a dangerous and costly procedure that every year prevents more than a million European patients from having a proper examination of their brain injuries. But that could soon be a thing of the past. This platform gives us neurosurgeons the possibility to understand what's happening in the brain without being invasive. Invasive measurements are nowadays standard in neurosurgery, but you can't use invasive measurements, for instance, with conscious patients. This equipment enables us to produce safer, faster and more accurate measurements of intracranial pressure. The platform is based on ultrasound technology. Ultrasound beams are gently applied to the eye. They measure blood flow parameters in two different regions of the ophthalmic artery. According to its developers, the ultrasound signal is processed in a fast and precise way. We're trying to measure the speed of blood particles and other parameters in really small vessels in the brain. The big challenge is to be accurate, so our platform must be very sensitive. That's why we had to develop innovative technologies, like digital signal processing solutions or filtering algorithms, all fit into a unified electronic platform. But the brain is much more than a fragile human organ. Children at the exhibition learn that the brain has the amazing capacity to increase its own potential almost by itself. But brains can also lose that potential at an equally fast pace when they grow older. Magnetic resonances have been conducted on London taxi drivers. It's been proved that they have a more developed hippocampus than other people. The hippocampus is the region responsible for memory. Why is it more developed in London taxi drivers? Well, because they've had to learn by heart London's street map, and they've developed this mental capacity.
Brain plasticity is the result of many different things, but neurons come top on the list. They are able to organize by themselves. They create networks. The more you stimulate them, the more these networks of neurons will be developed and reliable. On the other hand, the less you stimulate neurons, the more these networks disappear. At this unique lab in Vienna, scientists are engaged in hands-on brain research activities. They want to unveil the deepest molecular secrets of aging brains. They're particularly trying to understand why some old brains stay healthy while others develop neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. The neurons, the nerve cells, which have a lot of contacts between each other, they lose first these contacts. Then after they lose the contacts, then the neuron nerve cells will die. And parallel to this, they accumulate proteins, pathological proteins. This is what goes wrong in an Alzheimer's disease brain. And we want to discover what is the first step of this process? What is the earliest step of this process? When a patient goes to the doctor already with symptoms, then there are already, uh, the neurons are lost, the neurons are dead. We want to go back five or eight years before and a time when it really starts, this disease. Because, uh, this is... So far, researchers say they've learned quite a few things. They think that the same proteins and genes directly involved in the development of the brain may also have a role in its subsequent neurodegeneration as time goes by. And that discovery, they say, provides essential clues to improve the diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. It would be very important to understand why a portion of people remain not demented and, let's say, normal, whether they have any protective genetic alteration. So in our project, we not only focus on risk factors in the whole genome, but we also try to focus on protective factors. What type of genetic constellation can protect against Alzheimer's disease? If we find this genetic alteration, we can translate this to a protein level, and then we can generate a marker, or we can try to target these uh, pathways for therapy, because then we will know what is protective for the brain. Then we can generate something which can then be useful for other people. Brains children also learn at the exhibition have amazing, still hugely unexplored capabilities. They can, for instance, control robots or machines through computers. Complex techniques known as brain-computer interfaces are already being used by researchers to provide hope to people with no or reduced mobility in their arms or legs. We see more and more paraplegics who are able to use their brains to control machines through computers. We know that brains have incredible capabilities and, depending on what you connect them to, brains will be able to kind of communicate with those machines. So it is really hard to see what the limits of our brains are. At this lab in Linz, the brain is already used to turn lights on and off. Electrodes around the skull detect when electrical signals in the brain are more or less active. A computer reads that brain activity and translates it into orders to the light bulbs. But researchers here think the brain can be stimulated to do much more. It could, for instance, help paraplegic persons interact mentally with video games or play board games or open doors at distance. And the best, researchers say, may yet be to come.
Brain Computer Interfacing funktioniert im Prinzip so. Brain Computer Interfacing basically works the following way. You have electrodes that are placed at the right spots on the head, where certain brain waves can be measured. For our system, only one change in the brain signal is enough to build a computer control. Just as when you're using something, you refer to a single switch to activate a certain control, we can also use a single brain signal to activate a certain control in some machines. These researchers are already testing the possibilities of controlling sophisticated flying machines with a combination of sensor techniques, computer vision, and brain waves. And more down to earth, extremely practical applications are already on the way. One example would be the control with the brain of an e wheelchair in a very solid and precise way. Or controlling with the brain a computer. In that way, the computer would work a lot faster. We could also foresee a future where brain signals could help control orthosis, which could give highly paraplegic people the possibility to grab hold of things again. A future that's just around the corner, scientists maintain. But far more work is still needed, researchers conclude, before they can solve the many scientific puzzles still proposed by our fragile, sophisticated and virtually amazing brain.